What do you think are the odds that there is life elsewhere? Uh, they must be high, and, and I'll tell you why. People say, well, have you found life yet? No. Well, there, you know, that's like going to the ocean, this has been said before, and taking a cup of water, scooping up, and say, there are no whales in the ocean, you know? <laughs> Here's my data, you know? <laughs> you, you need a slightly bigger sample. And so if you look at, for example, what we call the radio bubble, this is the sphere around Earth, centered on Earth, which is the farthest our radio signals have reached in the galaxy. And they're about 70 light years away. We've been transmitting radio signals inadvertently leaking into space for about 70 years. 70 light year radius sphere. Well, how big is the galaxy? We'll shrink that sphere down to maybe the size of a BB, and then the galaxy on that scale would be the size of this stage. That's how far our radio signals have traveled. And those aren't even the ones we sent on purpose. The ones we sent on purpose have traveled much less. So no, we haven't actually um, reached as far into the galaxy as we'd like before we would say definitively that there's no one intelligent living today. But here's some very simple facts. I can review them in 90 seconds. You look at the formation of the Earth and the earliest sign of fossil life. Subtract a few hundred million years at the beginning of Earth when Earth was a shooting gallery. Earth was still accreting the, the, the birth materials of the solar system. It's hostile to complex chemistry over that time. Not fair to start the clock then. Wait a couple of hundred million years. Now start the clock and wait around and see when you have the first signs of single-celled life. At most, 400 million years. At most. Earth has been around for four and a half billion so Earth, without any help from us, with basic ingredients found throughout the universe, managed to create life, simple though it was. So, and Earth, one of, you know, eight planets, get over it. Uh, <laughs> what, uh, one of, sorry. <laughs> Earth, one, oh, an ordinary star, to suggest, and, and what, what are the ingredients of life? The number one atom in your body is hydrogen. Number two atom is oxygen, together making mostly water that's in you. Next is carbon in this order. Next is nitrogen. Next is other stuff. My favorite element, other, yeah. <laughs> you look in the universe, the number one element in the universe is hydrogen. Next is helium, chemically inert, couldn't do anything with it anyway. Next is carbon. I think I left out oxygen there. Next is oxygen, next is nitrogen, one for one. We're not even made of odd things. The most common things in the universe are found here on Earth and we're made of them. And carbon, one of the most chemically fertile, the most chemically fertile element on the periodic table. It's not a surprise, we're carbon-based. Life is just the extreme expression of complex chemistry. So. That's what life, that's what biology is. Point is, it happened relatively quickly with the most common ingredients in the universe. To now say life on Earth is unique in the universe would be inexcusably egocentric. The universe is huge in time and in space and in contents. So the good thing about the universe is extraordinarily rare phenomena happen every day, someplace in the universe. And so, However rare we might calculate it would be up here for life as we know it. You multiply up the numbers, stars in the galaxies, galaxies in the universe. These are staggeringly huge numbers, 10 to the 21 stars, a thousand times bigger than the number of grains of sand on an average beach. Itself, a hundred times bigger than the number of words ever spoken or uttered by all humans who have ever lived. These are staggeringly large, stupendously large numbers that give us the confidence that even if intelligent life is only short-lived, that there's bound to be one out there that we're hitting it right at the right time that they are happy to have a conversation with us if we're smart enough to have a conversation with them. If civilizations are common, or even slightly common, 
then there should be civilizations ahead of us. You imagine the timescales. We've been around as a civilization. Let's let's give it, say 40,000 years. I don't know how long our civilization's been around. Let's say that. The, the, the galaxy is pretty much as old as the universe. It's 13 billion years worth of time. So the idea that there are no, no civilizations arose, you know, 100 million years ago, 200 million years ago, 1 billion years ago. And imagine what they'd be like if they'd survived. I mean, we've been, we've been around, we've had science for, let's say, since Newton or Copernicus, 500 years at most. We've had, and look what we've done. We've, we've gone beyond the solar system with Voyager. We've walked on the moon. Um, we've, we're, we're about to go to Mars, I would think. So we're about to begin colonizing our own solar system. Um, so we've done that in 500 years. <laughs> so yeah. imagine a million years right. in the future. So I would, it's one of the arguments often used to say there aren't any civilizations out there in the galaxy. It's called the Fermi paradox. Because if you imagine a civilization that's a million years ahead of us, they should have written their presence across the sky by now. They should, you should see them. Hmm. I mean, you'll see us. If we survive a million years into the future, actually even a few thousand years into the future, we will be exploring the galaxy. We will have spacecraft that are going to other stars. We will be doing it. So our signature will become visible, I'm sure, if we last into the medium or term. Would we choose to not do that? Here's my thought on that is, like if there is a civilization that's a million times more advanced than us and mm. been around here for you know millions of years of life as opposed to quarter million, why would they why would they let us know? Like would they look at us dropping bombs on each other and polluting the ocean, sucking all the fish out and putting clouds into the skies of dirt and particles and yeah. why would they like look at these crude monkeys look at there they don't they're so far beyond where they need to be before they could join the galactic civilization <laughs> network true. or whatever it is true it's, a, it's an argument that yeah. there is an argument as well that it technology so advanced would be difficult for us to detect i mean we tend to think of you know when you say written across the sky i suppose it's true i'm thinking of starships and things yes. like star wars right? right big energy things that you can see the signature of but actually, it may be that the civilization just becomes a nano civilization, <laughs> a tiny yes. little nano, because that's more efficient. It's a better way to do things. So it's possible, I suppose, that there are space probes all over the place that are so small and are so efficient and use so little energy that we just don't see them. I suppose that is possible. The fact that we crossed over from talking merely about planets in our solar system to confirming their existence elsewhere. I mean, so we, we lost Pluto quite famously, but we gained, I don't know how many planets at this point, how many extrasolar planets have been over, over, over 4,000, yeah, and it's right. rising fast. Yeah, yeah. and so I mean, what, what's the safe assumption now that our, that our own galaxy has hundreds of billions of planets? I mean, and, and I mean, what, what, what's the yeah, number? So the, the, in, we do that calculation and you, in the section you know, are we alone in the universe? But you can ask a different set of philosophical questions, something that might titillate you. You can look at all of the layers of bias that are inherent in how we even go about answering those questions. Because even in your very statement, you said, well, how many planets? Because the life that you know, and the life that I know, lives on a planet. Mm. But maybe life also lives on moons. Maybe it lives in atmosphere. Maybe it lives in gas clouds. So we go through all of the all of the biases. There's a carbon bias, right? We are carbon-based life. Some of these biases, I think, are fully legitimate. But if you really want to search with as wide a net as possible, uh, also consider the the Goldilocks zone. So much yeah. was written and talked about for decades, from the 1950s and 60s, when this concept was first formulated where you, we know life thrives, needs, and thrives on liquid water. So if you're gonna stick a planet in a, in a star system, not too close, it'll, it'll evaporate the water. Not too far, it will freeze the water. So there's this zone, this belt around any star where a planet would naturally have liquid water. And you need atmospheric conditions to sustain it, of course, but you're not fighting it. It, it, it would happen naturally if the conditions allowed. And so then we learned, wait a minute, 
the sun is not the only source of energy in town. All right, Jupiter and its tidal stresses on its surrounding moons is a source of energy. So one of Jupiter's moons, Io, is the most volcanically active place in the entire solar system because Jupiter is pumping it with energy. And so now we have to think if life needs the warmth, warming energy of a heat of a, it just needs an energy source. Why does it have to have a star? Mm. And so you just, go on. and then we learn every model of the solar system that we construct that of any star system, when it's born, most of the planets that formed are on unstable orbits and they fly out into inter, inter uh, stellar space. It may be that there are more vagabond planets than there are planets bound to their local star systems. Mm. So you say, well, that's not a good prospect for life. However, Earth still has energy sources in its core. Yeah. Is this, is this how you get volcanoes and, 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 and all these um, mid-sea vents that are pumping very hot waters into the bottoms of the oceans? If you're a life form thriving on that, you don't even care if you were ever orbiting a sun. You could, you could be a frozen lake bed, on a frozen... Uh, ice on top but down below you could be doing the backstroke in your warmed hot tub hmm. so this notion that we want to look for planets and look for a habitable zone or a goldilocks zone may be needlessly restrictive as we as we go forward 